What is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. It is Tuesday, September the 25th, 2018. Smackdown Live came to us from the Pepsi Center once again in Denver, Colorado, and it was a very ominously ended show that took a few surprising twists and turns, and we all need to know about that one night in Milwaukee, and we are going to talk about it all right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare, and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Smackdown Live Review. Let's do it. The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. All right, wrestling fans, thank you so much for joining me. You know, the way this show went off the air tonight, I don't think I've seen anything like it on a wrestling show in quite some time. I don't remember the last time the WWE just went to black and left us at that. I actually enjoyed it, and the whole final segment of tonight's SmackDown Live was very creepy and very ominous. Imagine, if you will... You and an old friend had a falling out, and it got bitter, and you guys just didn't see eye to eye anymore, and you were at work one day, and you get a phone call from said friend, and you FaceTime him, and he's standing outside your door, where your wife and your kids or your girl or your father or mom or whoever you guys live with are inside, unaware of his presence on the outside, stalking your grounds like a demon in the night. And his only reason for being there is just to get under your skin, rile you up, play the mind games, but you still, in the back of your mind, have that fear that he is going to enter your house and cause you some harm, some way, to somebody that you love or to something that is important to you in some way. And that is the way this show went off the air tonight. You're talking high intense drama. Last night, Raw tried to be Game of Thrones. Tonight, we got the WWE trying to be Scandal with all of this family turmoil for AJ Styles. And then you have the one night in Milwaukee scenario that we all want to talk about. Listen, I really am interested to see where they are going to go with this. I don't think they are going to want to portray Lana as a brutal Filthy, dirty, bottom-feeding, trash bag hoe. Why would they want to do that? This woman is <laughs> is just... I, it makes no sense to be going down this route. Why would she want to have an affair with Aiden English? What, does she not know what a marshmallow tastes like? Does she not know the flavor of milk that she needs to run her tongue up and down his milky white body to figure out what he tastes like? Is that what it is? He's just so white that you need to know. Does he taste like a Malamar? Is he a Charleston Chew type thing with no, with no chocolate on the outside? Why would she sleep with Aiden English? It just makes no sense. It's coming completely out of left field, and it's clearly, to me, I truly believe that it's just Aiden English playing mind games. He's claiming now he's got video evidence. I cannot wait to see what this guy is going to bring to the table. My only thing about this whole thing is that it took up way too much time of tonight's SmackDown Live. I don't know why this is the dominant storyline that took over tonight's show. We have so many other interesting things going on on SmackDown Live that we could have devoted more time to. But all in all, tonight's show was passable. It wasn't perfect by any means, but there were a lot of segments that I did enjoy tonight. And for the most part, the majority of the show was very good. We got some good wrestling, but even more so, I got to give the WWE an A for effort in the entertainment department. They usually absolutely suck and cannot make me laugh and do not do anything funny when they try to do anything comedy but you cannot tell me that you did not find the opening segment of tonight's SmackDown Live absolutely hysterical. What have I been telling you guys on this show week in and week out as the WWE continues to use our truth He is proving me right more and more each and every week. His comedic timing is fantastic. The way he moves in the ring can rival or outdo anybody else he is in the ring with, even if they are half his age. Look at what he did in the ring with The Miz tonight. They got the crowd involved. They got everybody invested in a match that pretty much meant nothing with the exception of the Miz TV 
weekly show hanging in the balance. Our truth hijacked Miz TV because he beat the Miz last week. I beat the Miz, you don't have a championship, but you got a TV show, so I'm just going to come and take that. He's got Carmella sporting a whole new dark head look, looking a lot better. I think just distancing herself from her previous character with James Ellsworth just makes her a lot more attractive to look at. Plus her her pairing with R-Truth I think has just been great. I don't give a shit what they're doing on the Mixed Match Challenge, but I think for two people that are doing absolutely nothing to be paired together and be pulling off something, that's something to be commended. And R-Truth absolutely shined tonight in his in his Truth TV show segment and in his match with The Miz. Five stars from me all around. I'm a big R-Truth mark. I've been singing his praises for weeks and now you guys know why. You cannot dispute the fact that he is money. He's absolutely hysterical. And his wrestling ability is great. And they definitely need to explore this and keep going with R-Truth. Even if they have to side bag him with Carmella in order for us to get where we need to go, I think R-Truth deserves one more big time run and he's proving it every single week. It was absolutely fantastic. Quick Side note, this show that you are watching right now was almost called Truth TV. This whole channel was almost called Truth TV because it is my intention to bring to you the truth about professional wrestling and everything that it does to us as fans. But instead, we went this way, and now the hammer is swinging strong, and we are not swinging it that hard on SmackDown Live tonight, which has kind of become the weekly trend. Raw just absolutely shits the bed and makes me absolutely furious, and I just have to wave this thing around like the actual Thor with Molnir, and it just has a mind of its own almost on Monday nights. But on, on Tuesday, for the most part... We're in control because we had a pretty decent time tonight. Let's go back to the rest of the show. I love Truth TV. The segment was great. It was very, very entertainment, entertaining. Daniel Bryan as his debut guest, and this was just fantastic. And then we had the... Oh, yeah. We got it on this show, too. Seven-second dance break. That's right. Review. Seven second dance break right in the middle of Daniel Bryan's sentence. And then they would do this a couple of more times throughout the segment. And I just, I had a whole lot of fun with this. The way they were talking down The Miz. And then The Miz would come out and talk about the Super Showdown about a hundred times. Pointing out that everything that The Truth is doing is insulting to him. And this is his show and this is ridiculous. He goes back to pain you standing in the gorilla positions like, hello, get out there, I don't care, fight your fight, get your show, I don't care, and then she, the Miz goes and does what she says, and he goes and has this match with R-Truth, which was great. Like I said, awesome opening to the show, and I was great with it, except for the fact that the Miz would hit R-Truth with Daniel Bryan's signature running knee and get the win. I was really hoping R-Truth was going to win this matchup and take control of Truth TV and make it a real thing on SmackDown Live. I'd rather them change it up and go with Truth TV and do some fun and interesting things with R-Truth than have to see the same old Miz TV segment over and over and over again each and every single week. But I was all right with it because I didn't really expect him to win. Anyway, it was just a fool's hope. And I was a fool for even thinking it. So then we go on after this match. We see Charlotte Flair. The controversial Charlotte Flair posing for pictures. She was having a photo shoot. Why is she having a photo shoot? They didn't elaborate. Why is the champ not the one being featured in the photo shoot? Probably what Becky Lynch was thinking when she came out of nowhere and ambushed Charlotte Flair standing on her lifeless body when she was all done telling the cameraman take a picture of the champ while she was holding the title belt over Be over Charlotte Flair's body on the floor and it was a great segment. The crowd cheering again for Becky Lynch not really getting the reactions that they're wanting. It's just because she did that doesn't make her a heel. Everybody calm down. She has not been fully turned heel in the majority fans' point of view. The WWE might think so, but that is not the case. Becky Lynch is not a heel. She's being fantastic, and I definitely enjoyed this whole thing. The Becky chant was loud and proud, 
And then they announced that Charlotte Flair was sent home for the evening. <laughs> cry, cry so hard that your body rusts because you're a robot. Kids, go home. We want to see Becky anyway. Absolutely great. Sheamus with Cesaro, the bar, taking on the New Day in singles action as Sheamus would defeat Big E in a very, very good match. I expected this to be an absolute joke of a match, but these two big, massive mastodon of men went in there and threw down with a great match. Lots of power moves, a lot of great reversals, and it was very evenly fought. Both men not used to being in the ring with somebody who can equal their own power, and this match definitely showed it. The most interesting thing about this match was what happened before it, as they had the New Day come out and do the New Day comedy segment that they always love to do, but then... Something magical happens when Sheamus and Cesaro are standing in the ring before them and they take every single word that I say and throw it right at the New Day. They pretty much confront them with, you guys are a joke, you want to make everything a joke, all we want to do is come out and fight and we're going to show you what's up because we are the bar. I, I loved it because they were speaking everything that I feel about the New Day and why the New Day can't just go out there and wrestle and do their things every once in a while. You know, without having to joke and be ridiculous and talk about carpets matching drapes and comparing Cesaro to Jason Statham. I don't need all that. What I needed was a good match, and that's just what we had with Sheamus and Big E as the big man goes down to the Celtic Warrior. And now the bar is 2-0 and over the New Day in singles action. We'll have to see where that goes from here as the brogue kick was hit for the win. Backstage, once again, we had Paige, and she's begging the champ, Mr. Phenomenal, don't, please, don't beat up Mr. Joe, I want everything to go smoothly, right? Pointing out that there's expensive equipment at the ringside area, I don't want you breaking things up, I need to eat and my biscuits and drink my tea. <laughs> AJ Styles said, if he destroys anything tonight, it's going to be Samoa Joe. And on with the show we go. Rusev and Lana meet up backstage. Rusev is telling Lana and the world that all he wants to know is why. He's going to confront Aiden English, and he wants to know why he attacked him last week, because it seemingly came out of nowhere, and that's where we would go. Rusev and Lana come down to the ring to address Aiden English and talked about how he is a traitor. Aiden the traitor. He attacked him on Rusev Day. How dare he do that? <laughs> Aiden English would come out, start getting at Rusev, taking all the credit for the success of Rusev Day. He even had a little video package put together to highlight how he was the driving force, apparently, in his brain behind Rusev Day, a day that is named for somebody who is not Aiden English, but I understand where the man's coming from. He did allow Rusev to gain his momentum and get Rusev Day over to the point where it's at today. And then had another package, not the one in his pants, we'll talk about that in a minute, he had another package made up for Lana to show Rusev how Lana is the reason for all of this that is happening right now. Everything was fine until she came along. And then he showed this little video showing Lana screwing things up, getting in the way, distracting referees, doing all this nonsense. And then it would come back and he would accuse Lana, right? The crowd starts chanting Lana Day and Lana is the best, Lana number one. He's like, Lana is the best, but is Lana honest? Are you going to tell him about that one night in Milwaukee, where the crowd jumped all over it. They started to chant Milwaukee. Lana was very upset. She didn't even know what to say. Rusev looked very, very confused, and that would be the end of the segment as Aiden English would drop the mic and then walk off and leaving us with a very, very interesting scenario, one that I don't believe at all, and I think it's just going to be Mind Games by Aiden English. We would come back Again to this, backstage Lana and Rusev are trying to figure out what the hell he meant by saying Milwaukee when Becky Lynch would pop up out of nowhere for some reason and end up putting herself in a match with 
Lana. So we are going to see the champ versus Lana. I wasn't happy about this match being made. It just seemed out of nowhere and ridiculous. But who else is going to face Becky Lynch right now while she's in the midst of this madness with Charlotte? So I just said, screw it. We're going to watch it because it's going to happen. Let's do it. But that's not what they gave me next. What they gave me next was Naomi and Asuka, a team that I could really care less about. It's a shame that I'm saying that, but it really makes no sense that this duo is on the same team. There is nothing binding them together aside from their affinity for the neon green color that they both seemingly wear, and I just don't care for it. All to go up against the Iconics? Who's supposed to be the ones getting over in this scenario? You're trying to get the Iconics over by using Asuka once again, the way you have been doing all year long, and just having her used to elevate the people that you want, instead of focusing on her 900-day reign as one of the most dominant women in all of professional wrestling history, and now she's a joke? She's a stereotyped Japanese, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, Japanese language barrier in between the English language and her is just going to come off as comedy bullshit. And I don't want to see it. The accent. I think that's the word I was going for. The Japanese accent interrupting the English words. It comes off slightly racist and I'm not, I'm not all for it. I'm not all for it. On the positive side, at least Naomi and Asuka are being put on TV. Unfortunately, they have to go up against people like Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville while they're in a feud with the Iconics. So tonight we had to see the Spaz Queen, Sonya Deville, and the very beautiful and talentless Mandy Rose grace the ring tonight. And the finish would come when Naomi and Asuka would deliver this very pretty looking double kick and get the win. And that would be the end of that, thank God. Then we would get one of my favorite segments of the night, although they would ruin it shortly after the United States champion Shinsuke Nakamura defeated Ty Dillinger in a non-title match tonight. Randy Orton is the story here. It just was completely out of left field. Randy Orton attacked Ty Dillinger, beating him all around the ringside area, dropping him on the announce table, and then delivering the draping DDT from the ring apron to the floor on the outside. Absolutely unbelievable. It made sense to me in the initial reaction because what is Randy Orton's mission right now? He wants to take out all of the crowd favorites, everybody that we love, and Ty Dillinger definitely fits that MO. My immediate thought is Ty Dillinger is about to become a star. The star he's always wanted to be. Imagine Ty Dillinger trying to get revenge on Randy Orton following the heinous acts we saw him pull tonight on one of the biggest baby faces on SmackDown Live. A guy that hasn't gotten the respect that he deserves. A guy that a lot of the fans are pulling for because they love to do the 10 count, right? This was the perfect way to go about this with the perfect 10 as the, the protagonist for Randy Orton to assault and get underneath our skin with. So this was great. I loved every minute of it. What I didn't love was Nakamura hitting Ty Dillinger with a Kinshasa so hard that his head bounced off the LED board of the ring. It was, it was just something to see. It was absolute brutality. The interesting thing to note here is that this is the second time Randy Orton has attacked some of our favorite baby faces while they have been fighting Shinsuke Nakamura. The whole feud with Jeff Hardy was born out of his interference in the match with Nakamura. And it's a wonder to me if that's some sort of a hint or some sort of a clue. Maybe rated Shinsuke O is going to really be a thing at some point. But as of right now, both men are still on an island unto themselves. Randy Orton playing up this heel role the way I told each and every one of you he would. He is saving SmackDown Live almost single-handedly from absolute mediocrity just by being a heel and doing shit that we seen him do tonight. Absolutely fantastic. But then you have to have Randy Orton in the back, right? And he's talking to, what's his name? Mike Rome. And Mike Rome just puts it out there. Oh, is he your next target? Why don't you leave it alone? This interview was very unnecessary. You could have left it hanging. It was automatically assumed by all of us that Ty Dillinger is the next target. That would be like some idiot while everybody's standing around looking at the blue sky and going, hey, is the sky blue? Of course it's fucking blue, you idiot. Of course this is his next target. At least that's what you're led to believe. But then Randy Orton says he's not. And that he just attacked him because he hates that perfect 10 chan. It pisses him off. 
I didn't like that. That throws a little shade onto Ty Dillinger. It kicks him off as a nothing, something insignificant. I just don't like the chant he gets from the crowd. I'm not, I don't give a shit about Ty Dillinger. I'm still curious to see as to who his main target might be. But I think this was the way to go. I think this was a great program they could have explored in the next couple of weeks leading into this super showdown and the crown jewel thing. Why couldn't we have Ty Dillinger versus Randy Orton on one of these things? Maybe in a no DQ match or or a false count anywhere. Something intriguing for the perfect 10. Ty Dillinger to get his revenge on Randy Orton. What a fucking great segment this was. I absolutely enjoyed it. We had Becky Lynch defeating Lana. This match was very inconsequential, although I will say Lana is definitely improved. This was probably the best match I've seen her have in her whole entire career. If you want to attribute that to Becky Lynch being such a badass and being so good in the ring, I wouldn't blame you for doing so, but I got to give a little bit of credit. She was playing off the fact that she was really pissed off, and obviously Lana was frustrated, and she was trying to get it all out on the champ but the champ wasn't having it, and before you know, she would lock Lana up in the disarmor for the win, and the champ goes on and celebrated by the crowd. Everybody's happy. Nobody was mad that Becky beat Lana. But I, I wonder if that was some sort of a strategy by the WWE, because Lana was going to have the sympathy of the crowd all night long. So did they think the crowd was going to boo Becky Lynch for Lana because of what she was put through on this night? Something that I think of. Maybe not many other people will. But now you know, and that's why you come to me, because I fill you guys in on little beautiful nuggets like that. We go backstage once again, and Aiden English tells whoever that new girl is, I don't know where they friggin' fabricated her from, Just out of nowhere, some new promo bot from the factory, 827B. She's standing back there. She wants to talk to Aiden English, and she wants him to just tell us all about that night in Milwaukee. And he's like, tonight's not the night for that, and I'm not going to tell you that. But next week, I'm going to show you video footage, because he has proof. We'll have to wait and see what the hell this is all about. Hopefully, it's not some stupid GTV sort of thing that we're never even going to have finality to. But as it stands right now, we have to wait till next week to see what Aiden English has in store for the world with Lana. Maybe we'll get to see some Russian butt cheeks. Hmm? <laughs> Who knows? Paige! Once again, <laughs> was in the ring for the contract signing, which we talked about at the start of this thing. The contract signing seen AJ Styles come to the ring very confident, very kind of smug, if you ask me, talking about how Samoa Joe's not going to be here. Are you kidding me? It's no wonder he's not coming out when Paige is introducing him. He knows he doesn't want to stand eye to eye with the champ and that he can't get it done. But then suddenly Joe appears on the screen in front of AJ Styles' home. And he's pointing out that you, AJ Styles, are far away in Colorado. Thousands of miles away. This was a great promo segment. The only thing I will say about it is that obviously it was pre-taped. And if you are going to do something like that, at least have the scripts make it seem like they're actually talking to each other. Because it seems like Samoa Joe can see AJ Styles the way he's talking to the camera. But... He was not ever directly answering AJ Styles. AJ is begging and pleading with him. Please don't go in my home. Please don't do this. uh, Come on, Samoa Joe. Come on, please. Come on, come on. Don't do this. And at no point was he acknowledging any of this man's pleas. And it wasn't that he was ignoring him and that they weren't making it seem like he didn't care. His responses and his retorts at the time of the things that AJ Styles were saying were just very basic and very generic. Like, oh, oh. Oh, you don't know what I'm going to do? Oh, you don't, you know what I'm going to do now? Oh, you don't like that, AJ? You don't like that, AJ? And he's like, please, Joe, come on. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh. I'm like, come on. You, gotta, you could have definitely penned that out. Obviously, it was going to be a pre-taped segment. So you have AJ go out there, and you have him practice. So when Joe says, I'm outside your house, and then AJ goes, please, Joe, don't. He'll go, no, no, don't ask me not to. I'm going to do this. 
you stole my belt, blah, blah, blah. And then Joe goes, please, my daughter's in there. Please, that's right, your daughter's in here, and I got a doll for her. Like, write it out. Make it a little bit more smooth. And it would have been a hundred times better than it even was. That's the only... I might seem like I'm nitpicking at this point, but when I'm looking at everything, I'm looking at it as a whole, and it was not very fluid. Didn't seem very interactive. It seemed very staged. But the words and the way everything came out from both of these guys and the way he says to AJ and rings the doorbell of AJ Styles' house and says, Daddy's home to the camera and Smackdown Live cuts to black the way the whole entire series of The Sopranos ended. It just left me like, wow. I need to know what the hell is going on. Absolutely great ending of the show. A great beginning of the show. Few highlights in the middle the, you know, the women's division, meh, gonna be nice about it only because of all the heat that's been being thrown around based off of what happened last night, and I'm not gonna say any more about it, I said my piece, I'm sticking to my guns, I'm not going back on anything that I said about Brie Bella last night on the Monday Night Raw review, but I feel like as a community, our day would have been better served maybe offering our support to Liv Morgan instead of all of us, myself included, bashing the shit out of Brie Bella and voicing our displeasure of what happened last night. Maybe we gotta take a look at ourselves in the mirror sometimes and go, hey guys, let's calm down and remember that there's a young girl right now that might have a couple of screws knocked loose and might have a whole career in the balance. We can worry about who and blame anybody we want down the line when we see the results of what's happened to Liv Morgan as of right now, let's all uh, take it a little easy and back off. The girl is a human being. She has feelings. And I'm sure she feels bad for what she's done. And we're probably only making it worse. So let's try to be a little bit more supportive of one another. It's a wrestling family we're trying to grow here. I want to be friends with everybody. But if you want to continue to be a dick, by all means, go ahead. I was a dick. I was a dick about it last night, but, you know, sometimes you, you have to wake up and smell the roses. And sometimes you have a nice cup of coffee on a Tuesday morning and go, maybe I went a little bit too hard on Monday night. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go check out Monday Night Raw Review that's up on the channel right now. It was a whole lot of fun. It was a very intense episode as Monday nights tend to be here on the channel. Tuesday, we have a little bit more lax of an attitude. Every other day and every other show we talk about is always a whole lot more fun because Raw is just the absolute worst show in all of professional wrestling. SmackDown Live, not that bad. Hopefully, we continue to rise up, and this is a few nice steps in a good direction, but for the most part, this was a this was an okay show, and I'll I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you guys so much for being with us here tonight. As always, if you are new to this channel, make sure you are subscribed. We are marching towards 1K. We are almost there. All it takes is a super awesome wrestling fan, just like yourself, to engage and decide to become part of the greatest club that is growing by the numbers right now, the Sledgehammer Club, full of the most awesome, coolest, funniest, most knowledgeable wrestling fans you will ever get to know in your life. All you have to do is is hit them up in the comments section. All my guys are always down there. They are O N gals, always down there. Bring in the fire in the comments section. I want to know what your guys' favorite moment of tonight's SmackDown Live was. Let me know if you thought I was going to come down harder on tonight's SmackDown Live and what angles you thought I was going to come down hardest on. If you don't think I was being my normal self, maybe you think I'm being a little bit too lenient with SmackDown Live. Let me know. I want to know your opinion. This way we can interact and have a great wrestling conversation. I will see you guys myself down in the comments section a little later on after this show goes live. So make sure you hit me up. I'll probably see it and maybe even respond and then we could talk a little bit later on tonight. And then, I need you guys to bash the shit out of that like button. If you enjoyed today's show, you enjoyed my points, you, you know what this show is all about. If you love it, hit that thumbs up. Make sure that I know it. Share this video with all of your wrestling friends all over the wrestling world. Each and every one of your wrestling buddies deserves to know that we are here, especially if they enjoyed tonight's episode of SmackDown Live and hate Monday Night Raw. You know in which way to direct them, and that is right here to the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV. All of my audio guys, make sure you come to the YouTube channel and join on board there and get to see everything live and in color. We are available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify. Each and every one of you guys, thank you for listening to us as always, and please come over 
to the YouTube channel and join the official club where everything goes up first, including tomorrow's episode of the Subscription Box Showdown going to be dropping. September's episode is better than August's, and I need you guys to help me once again pick September's winner. And if you're interested to find out who won last week, last month rather, and you put in your vote, you want to see if your vote won, check out the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's subscription box showdown coming at you guys tomorrow, 10 a.m. New York City Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you are subscribed and notified. This way, you do not miss it. Thank you guys all so very much. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is my trusty team for the Sledgehammer, the wrestling god of thunder, and the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. My little buddy and the world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball. We are so glad to be here with you guys each and every time the WWE wants to throw something at us and we get to talk about it with you guys. That, my friends, is going to do it, and we are out of here, and we will see you tomorrow morning for the subscription box showdown, and then tomorrow night for the May Young Classic, right here on Sledge Hammer TV. Oh, you didn't think I was going to hit you with that one again, huh? Well, it'll be the last time you did it.